Is everybody there? Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the seminar, everybody. Uh, the seminar is on decolonizing heritage, ownership and engagement of South Africa's human record, brought to you today by the Human Evolution Research Institute, or HERI, at the University of Cape Town as part of our winter series, and the Paleo Research Institute at the University of Johannesburg. I'm Wendy Black. I'm a HERI board member and the curator of archaeology at Iziko Museums of South Africa. And I'm grateful to be welcoming, welcoming all of you to this important discussion today. Uh, historically, heritage in Africa has been represented, perceived, marginalized, shared, and managed within colonial or racist frameworks, leaving out many essential voices. And this needs to change. In the discussion today, we will reflect and interrogate these challenges we face in instill instilling this change and recognize the need to address things like ongoing inequalities and the need for general heritage transformation. To help us tackle these topics today in an open conversation, we have some wonderful speakers lined up, including Dr. Dupuyo Khotling, from the director of Paleo Research Institute at the University of Johannesburg, Mr. Mutsatebe Serekwane from the South African Heritage Resources Agency. It's a council member based um, within the Heritage Resources Management Committee, as well as Dr. Jonathan Saleh, also a HERI board member and the senior lecturer in the Department of Archaeology at the University of Cape Town. We thank you all for taking time out of your busy days to join us today. Uh, the talk is scheduled for an hour, uh, but we have set aside 90 minutes to make sure that we have got some extra time so we can answer as many questions as possible and hear as many of your comments as possible. Uh, please note that we will be recording this seminar because a lot of people have asked for that. Um, I'm very glad to introduce uh, Ms. Robin Humphreys. She will be moderating this discussion today. She is also part of HERI and is a PhD candidate at the University of Cape Town Department of Archaeology. Um, and she's doing some groundbreaking work on community engagements with heritage, specifically focused on issues around human remains collections. Thank you, Robin, for guiding this discussion today, and I hand over to you. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, so I think I will ask maybe the speakers want to introduce themselves and just talk a bit more about their experience with um, heritage before we start the questions. I don't know, Dipuyo, do you want to go first? Thank you, Robin. My name, hello everyone. I see we have a house full of guests today. My name is Dipuo Winu Khotling. I'm the director of the Paleo Research Institute. I've been trying to go into the light so that you can all see me. I apologize for the quite bad lighting. However, I'm so excited for today's discussion. I'm looking forward to having this engaging session with colleagues from UCT, from HERI, and also with Muta Tebe as well. Um, in, to what promises to be a very great afternoon. Uh, my experience with heritage, I've been an archaeology student since the year 2000, so I've been in the field for, I'm exposing my age right now. Um, I've, I've mainly dabbled with the policy aspect of heritage, so my work experience has mainly been in the administration and management of heritage. I've worked for various national and provincial organizations that manage um, heritage within the country for, for the Northwest Department of Agriculture, where we were responsible for the management of um, the Fred Ford Dome and the Downscale World well Heritage Site. I've worked for policy in the policy space um, in, with the Department of Science and Technology and the National Research Foundation, where we were administering the management of paleo sciences in the country. So, and I've, I've I've worked in the CRM space where I've done a number of uh, cultural resource management projects where we go on site and manage projects for industry and various companies. So, and also being in a, currently in the space in academia where I'm currently the manager, the director of the Paleo Research Institute. So my, I straddle both with an industry when it comes to heritage and also uh, back into academia in recent times. So that is my experience basically when it comes to heritage. Thank you, Tabuyo. And I think it's like, I think often people 
don't know how much power there is in policy because <laughs> policy shapes what happens and what people have to do. So I think that's such important work in terms of heritage and decolonizing heritage. So, so yeah, thank you for that as well, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's that, David? Do you want to um, share a bit about your your work and what you how you've been involved in heritage? So I'm um, uh, good afternoon to to everybody. I'm also equally excited to be here. I don't know if am, am I audible, Robin? Um, are you able to hear me? Are you are you okay with that shot? Thank you. So my name is Mozart, and I'm based in Bloemfontein. So I work full time for the University of the Free State, and my little bit of knowledge and experience in heritage uh, pushed me to the South African Heritage Resources Agency, and this after being appointed by the um, local MEC, uh, Mrs. Mahatsa, as the chairperson of um, the Provincial Heritage Resource Authority. So I don't know if, if this will sum up my experience as far as the heritage is concerned. I was behind the relocation of the MTN Stain statue to the, world, um, to the World War Museum. It took us two years. I practically did the conceptual process with colleagues that were tasked by the rectorate to to really facilitate the process and i want to say the intention from the beginning was not to relocate the intention was to respond to the student call for the statue to to be relocated and we we tried very hard uh, i think probably for the first time to also just make sure that we observe processes as as outlined is required by the constitution but as outlined also by the national um, national Her heritage resources act so two years of two years of that um, sums up what what I know about heritage. Um, it's, it's not for the sissies, but yeah, I'm here. Thank you so much. Yes, and it, it's not for the sissies. I'm sure it must have been. There's a lot of. I think um, there are so many stakeholders and so many things to consider and. So many possibilities. Um, it's a lot to think about when you're dealing with heritage. So I'm sure you're going to have a lot to share with us today. And then we also have Jonathan. Do you want to share a bit about your experience um, with heritage? <clears throat> yes. So um, um, I'm originally from Ethiopia. So I have done a lot of field work and uh, museum research in Ethiopia in the National Museum. I've also worked for the National Museum for Impact Assessment uh, Projects, um, in, in particular for a mega dam project uh, on the Omo River. Um, I have been um, exposed to different universities uh, and university systems, both in Ethiopia, um, here in South Africa, where, where I did my, my PhD, and also in the States, where I did my postdoc, as well as in, in Europe, um, I have been working as a research group leader in Germany for four years before joining uh, UCT um, in my current position. So these different experiences in different parts of the world, but mostly in Ethiopia, uh, partly in Kenya and, and to some extent in South Africa, have exposed me to the way research is conducted and um, heritage is curated and exhibited and um, what the challenges in these are, and these are what we are going to um, explore uh, in this event. And, and I'm very excited um, to be here to speak to you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. And I'm, I'm excited because it's it's not often that you have people who have um, the, the heritage experience and our academics um, and such vast experience as well. Um, and can contribute um, to, under, to unpacking what, what the, the consequences of, of our research in terms of heritage as well. Um, so my first question is um, Mutatebe with us still. I'm not seeing his, um, I'm not seeing your camera Mutatebe if you are here. Oh. He's trying to reconnect. Okay. So I think uh, maybe I'll then just ask to what you, is, what does heritage mean um, in South Africa? It's such a big concept, such a contested concept. What do you think when it comes to, especially human evolution, what do we have to think about when it comes to heritage? Um, thanks, Robin. Um, I think the question of heritage is quite an interesting one because 
um, as most of us are aware, the field of heritage studies is quite a new, it's quite a new field. It's not necessarily an old concept that has been studied over decades or centuries. However, heritage on itself being, uh, being the definition of heritage on it, in itself, it's something that is quite new. So when I think of heritage, I think of social, social political construct. I think of terms that are used in various context, contexts, whether it's social, social context, whether it's political concept or economic concept. You take an example within our country, um, how the concept of heritage and what heritage is has evolved. I mean, you go back to the era when uh, the pre-1900 era when there was a lot of amateur archaeologists, paleontologists going around the country picking up relics to take back to their colonial homes. I mean, that then the concept of heritage was something totally different from what we have now post-1994 when heritage now has been de de defined. However, even within that definition, the concept of heritage still resembles what heritage has been pre uh, the current democratic dispensation. I'll, I'll just give you an example of when some of the earliest laws were enacted in the country of what how what we recognize as heritage and how we protect that heritage. I mean, we have in 1911 the, the, the Relics Act when some of the relics, what was called then called the the Sen, Sen and Koi relics were being uh, uh, protected. Uh, the, the Relics Act when it was inscripted to protect those uh first of all the movement the recording and the the transport of those uh relics but then post uh the new dispensation now we have a more inclusive somewhat seemingly inclusive and i think throughout the the course of the day we'll have a broader discussion as to some of those definitions and some of those legalities as to how we define and what we think heritage is and I think um, when you look at uh, your Western countries, what they define as their heritage and how they define and, and present their heritage is quite different. So for me, heritage, it's, it's context specific. It's social, it has a social, social political and uh, economic undertone. So there is not really a, def a definitive uh, term that you can use to define heritage, but based on where you are, what time you are, geographic area you are, then you define heritage based on those uh, uh, con uh, contextual basis. So, so Robin, to answer your question, heritage is whatever you want it to be. I mean, my earphones could be my heritage. Um, you know, it, 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 it's based on my identity and what I deem to be important to myself. And I think my colleagues can elaborate more on, on this concept. Thanks, Tupuyo. Yeah, I think there's, I think that you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's such a contested term and it has so many implications. And I think often we as archaeologists want to forget about those social, political, economic implications of the work that we do. Um, and yet they're also important in connecting people to the work that we do um, and, and having people engage with it. Um, that, does anyone want to um, give some input on what Puyo said? Um, Maybe, um, Jonathan, based on your experience in Ethiopia or in the other locations you've worked in, in Europe, the USA, how the, the idea of heritage changes as you move to different spaces. I, I think I totally agree with uh, what Dupio has uh, alluded to. It's a, it's a controversial term. It's a controversial concept. Um, but at the root of all it is, you know, it has to be what you um, what you would like to consider as heritage in your own context and in your own um, in your own ways, you know, it, it doesn't have to be someone imposing um, on you or agreeing with you uh, about its value. As as long as it, it, you 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 are happy that it is your value and it sort of contributes to um, your connection to the past and your cohesion, social cohesion and economic growth and, and whatnot, then I think it should be considered a heritage. So that, that there is no single, you know, one size fits all kind of definition for heritage. And, and I totally agree that it is a controversial term and we don't have to be lost in the semantics of it, but at the bottom, at the root of it all is that it has to be something that a society uh, a community values and wants to designate as heritage. 
Thanks, Jonathan. And I think, yeah, also what Dupuyo was saying is like there's this importance of connection. Um, <clears throat> and 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 it's a large part of it is how we engage with something. Um, but at the same time, when you look at the, um, and what's at table, maybe you can talk about this more, if you look at the leg legislation and the policy, so much of it focuses on conservation <laughs> um, and maintenance, and, and there's less focus on the connection to the past, or maybe I'm wrong. Do you want to tell us about that, what's at table, um, and Sara, and how it views heritage? So, let's start, and then I just, I just want to ask if you, because I'm getting a sort of a, a background. I'm not sure if I should. In Maybe we should just put up our cameras while you're talking, Mr. Tebe. Can we do that? Oh, we can't hear you. Maybe unplug your um your 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 earphones. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, you're muted. I'm so sorry. You need, you need to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. Did you unmute yourself? Um, so at the top, there should be a, a mic and a camera. Do you see that? If you hover over your face. Nothing. And if you, because you could hear you. Um, yes, it, it, mo, sorry to jump in. Mo, it's Laura here, Motsatebe. Please use your mouse and go over your picture. And above a little toolbar will show and it'll show a little mic that's red. You have to click on that. Can you see that? We can't control your um, mic. You've clicked, yeah, you've muted yourself. Maybe, uh, if I, I'll just remove you and bring you back in and see if that solves the issue. Okay. Okay. So I think <laughs> we'll just, um, yeah, we'll, we'll wait for once to take me to come back, but I think I'll just ask um, a few other questions. And I think um, one question that has come up and I can ask Jonathan is how do you think um, your the different histories have impacted how heritage is engaged with in different countries? So what is your experience in Ethiopia versus um, Ethiopia. South South Africa? South, 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 South. Yeah, so um, um, in Ethiopia, as um, some of you might know, um, there is no colonial history uh, per se. Uh, but there is the, the concept of coloniality, these post-colonial um, influences, um, and so much so that in, in the uh, decades that followed the 1950s, which is when modern archaeology was uh, being practiced and, and the institutions being established in Ethiopia, we see an increasing influence from um, particularly French archaeologists and um, institutions, um, as well as other European and North American, uh, either research groups or universities or um, uh, museums or institutions that come in the way in the, uh, you know, with the understanding or camouflage, I would, I would like to call it camouflage of uh, collaboration, but are actually imposing um, their own ways of defining heritage, and and that is problematic, um, as uh, as was uh, indicated by my by my colleagues. Um, it is problematic because, you know, what whatever works as heritage for you does not necessarily work for other societies and contexts, and vice versa. And uh, and also the, the you know one example I can provide here is that for example when the, the iconic fossil Lucy was discovered, um, the the paleoanthropologists who are still alive today and famous uh, by world world standards um, had to um, you know had to compare in the field the fossil remains and what they did was they went to the the local pastoralist gra graveyards and they stole. Uh, skeletons from the graveyards, and we all know that in Af in most African societies and and um, 
um, communities, there is a very strong connection to the dead, and there is, you know, the concept of the, you know, the spirits lingering around, the spirits of the dead lingering around, and the, you know, the belief that the, these should not be disturbed, and this should be, uh, you know, this should be almost revered and untouched. Those concepts and and uh, practices may not work necessarily for western modern in, in quotation modern societies and uh, you see the malpractice um, of that and you know i mean in, in some instances these are even illegal practices that are being practiced uh, and so whatever is considered heritage has been mostly defined by what is brought with the modern uh, fields of study in these countries, you know, modern history, modern um, uh, archaeology uh, and, and uh, anthropology. And one thing we shouldn't forget is that all of these fields of study have a very, very ugly colonial past and they were mostly designed to, um, to justify that uh, you know, Africa and African nations are uncivilized and savages and barbarians that need to be civilized. And so with this civilizing, the, the, this civilizing mission in the background, uh, we see the distorted definition of heritage and a lot of, um, um, a lot of heritage and relics of very important value to local communities and societies being destroyed in the process until very recently. And in some instances, some of these concepts being perpetuated and affecting, uh, you know, modern um, researchers such as myself and, and, and a lot of colleagues. Thanks, Jonathan. Wow, really, <laughs> I'm like, I'm shocked. Anyway, you told me about them what did they do with the with the with the human remains after they were done? Well, I mean, nobody knows uh, because you know they they admitted that much later. You know, probably decades after they they did that. But it just you know sends a shock to uh, to me, for example, as as an archaeologist and as a paleontologist, that someone that has taken introduction to anthropology courses should do that you know the first thing you should know is that you need to respect the cultures and um, and norms standards of the society that you, that that is hosting you um, you know not necessarily because you study it but because you are in that land and you know different lands have different different um, parts of the land you know the landscape itself has different meanings to different societies so yeah it is really really sad but yeah a reality wow it, and i think what it speaks to also i think is also like this idea that we always have to like look far back at like raven dots <laughs> do you know what i mean like or and and it's just like archaeology and paleoanthropology is such a young discipline also so it's not like we have many generations to to look back on <laughs> But people were doing this, um, and 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 I think it's an extension. We have to grapple with that, the fact that people don't respect cultural um, beliefs, norms, um, and 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 they they undermine that. that um, and actions are quite harmful in the name of science. Um, so TB, are you able to unmute yourself? I, I'm not sure if you've been having. Oh, have you had some success? Okay, awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Mosatim. Sorry about earlier. And maybe you can come in and talk about, I think was um, Jonathan, that was an important point. It's the that there are like global forces of power and access to money and resources that shape how, even if you are a, a very independent country, you still have um, powerful researchers who can impact how um, work research is conducted in your area and then also there's grappling with the colonial history in South Africa. Um, do you want to share a bit about the statue and the contestation and how you grapple with um, different ideas of memorialization and beliefs about how to manage sites? Sorry, Mozart, we, we, we can't hear you at the moment. Okay. 
Are you able to unmute without the earphones? Okay, so I think it'll reconnect. Um, okay. Are you able to hear? Yes, we can hear you now. So let's let let let's start with the the construct of heritage in a post-conflict society, right? Because then, in that way, we speak into a specific context. Now, I I, I probably want to say the global South, but I want to specifically look at the at the South African context right so I'm, I'm getting a bit of a background so it's it's irritating me a bit um so uh, can you unmute sorry what's the TV You, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? But we can't hear you. Sorry. And is the, okay. Sorry about that. Um, I'll just ask, do you do you mind coming back? Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. I'm going to ask Puyo, what's your experience been like? I think um, being a black woman in the discipline of archeology, span um, that is, was largely colonial, still there are many um, white men in the field. Um, what has your experience been with heritage and, and, and having different um, communities engaged with the site and then you know, having archaeologists on the site as well? Thanks, Robin. Um, I think one thing that is interesting about um, all of this is that, I mean, archaeology, paleoanthropology, anthropology, in themselves, those concepts are Western concepts. Um, just those that is inherently, I mean, I, I don't, and I stand to be corrected, I'm not a historian or, but I, I, I've never heard of a concept where within our cultures, we go and study other cultures for the sake of creating knowledge about the culture. I mean, in, in their essence, I mean, take archaeology for an example, even the caricatures that we know of what archaeology is in movies and TVs, I mean, highly, highly colonial, Western and imperialist in nature. Um, and I think the struggle comes with having to marry those kinds of disciplines within our context and, and for even for people like ourselves who are uh, who, who, who are Africans, I mean, having to incorporate ourselves into highly, highly Western uh, studies. Um, and, and for somebody like myself, who, who started in this field just a few years post-democracy, it, it was quite, it was quite, it, it was quite a, an eye-opener. I, I didn't expect um, being a local and also now having to integrate yourself as now part of this highly colonial discipline, going into communities, you know, doing research, doing excavations, uh, being part of the oral, uh, people who are conducting oral histories and all of that. It, it was quite a challenge because you find yourself grappling with how to integrate your Western stance into how you conduct uh, your research and field work and engaging with communities, but also remembering that you are just as much part of those communities that you are now calling communities. I mean, you you you, you are basically trying to study yourself. So it, it was quite a challenge. It was quite, um, it still is, and to be honest, it still is, because even within current day context, it still becomes difficult to, to try and marry yourself as an archaeologist and also understanding that you might be an archaeologist, but also there is a, a local community is, you are a local community yourself. You you are part of the the the, the, the subject. I mean, you are you, you are in as much as you you are a, the researcher, but you are also the subject. So 
um, the concept of archaeology in itself. And I think when we're talking about decolonizing heritage, decolonizing these studies, we have to take it back to understanding that in as much as we are trying to decolonize inherently within themselves, these studies are highly colonial in their, in their approach, in their practices, and in their presentation. I mean, the whole work process is highly colonial. I mean, how you go about collecting data, how you go about uh, recording that data, how you go about uh, presenting that data in each and every step of the process, you are used. I mean, it's it would be quite difficult to 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 turn over a leaf and um, remove yourselves from the colonized perspective. But inherently within themselves, and I think when we're talking about decolonizing heritage, we constantly we have to start from the basis of when, especially. And, and it's quite difficult for people who are not within these kinds of fields. It's it's actually I think it's it's easier rather than when you are within this highly Western colonialized uh, field that we have to understand that the process in itself is a very Western colonized process. Thanks to Puyo. Wow. <laughs> Yo, yeah, that was so wonderful. I think like even like you just it, it reminds me of this quote and and I don't see back don't remember the author's name, but he was, he's an archaeologist in South America and he was saying, um, even as I'm walking towards decolonization, this discipline, <laughs> the ground that is below me is moving in the other direction. And it's because of the whole idea of archaeology and the the concepts and the, the theoretical frameworks that inform our research. It's so outside of other knowledge systems and has not engaged with other knowledge systems and our own experiences as people of the community, as Africans, that do you know those embo that embodied knowledge um, and how do you bring that into heritage? Um, and what's that thing where I hope we can have some, you can help us now <laughs> think about how we bring that knowledge into, into practice and what your experience with that has been. Uh, I, I hope I will be able to to come through this time, right? So there's been it, it's almost like I've lost what my colleagues have been engaging with. So if I repeat what you've said, please just pardon me. Um, but I'm glad that I can speak and there's absolutely no background. Now understand that when the student said her, uh, has tech statues must fall, there was a particular kind of call to a specific kind of disposition. And, and it was linked to um, what became a, a hashtag decolonize the, the knowledge system, right? And the reluctance of the discipline to undiscipline was a, a way a perpetual kind of a, in a subtle complexity is in making sure that you contribute to what us as, as, as heritage practitioners are advocating. And now you've got this piece of legislation that in its nature, it's actually colonial. Right? It has a strong colonial kind of undertone. And I want to read a preamble of that particular legislation. And I, I would like us to, in the, you know, in the interest of discussing decolonial stuff, that we look at what is it that is saying and how does that loosely translate into practice? So let's let's just think for a moment on, on the construct of preservation and conservation. And we try to interrogate that in the post-conflict society. Now we can speak to, to the global South, but we can also speak to, to South Africa in particular. So part of the global South, and I know my colleagues uh, Mbiti wrote an article about the, their reflection on the construct of heritage in Zimbabwe. And they spoke first to the colonial footprints, and they wanted to look at how how the spatial uh, transformation is it's it's reflecting um, both the current but in relation to to, uh, to the past. So there's a gap there. In South Africa, there's about many footprints. There's there's colonial, but also apartheid, and now we sit in South Africa. Now let's understand this and read it in line with the National Development Plan. What was the promise there? A disaggregation of, um, of places and spaces. And we need to just remind ourselves that places and spaces at one stage was, was actually reserved for, for, for exclusive use. And now we, we find in people um, accessing these particular places. And, and the first thing that you ask is, do I belong? And, and if somebody says, but you hear you belong, the second question is going to be, 
what about this particular space speaks to me? Right? Spatial identity. What, what about this particular space speaks to me? What about this particular space? It's actually a sort of a, a decoding of the, the narrative of the people that existed before me, people that look like me, that were here before, before I became. And now we, we, we have to really just assume a, cush, a cushion, for example, now of Mignola epistemic disobedience, right? So sometimes we need to allow the North to, or us, the North humbly to just keep quiet so that the South can speak. And the North needs to understand that the South has a knowledge system that is actually as credible as that of the South, that we, we find a sort of a functional praxis where the both knowledges can speak to each other. And we don't want anybody to legitimize our knowledge because this knowledge existed for as long as we can remember. And we can easily consider this particular knowledge as, 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 as actually legitimate without having to try too hard to, to make sure that um, we, 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 we come across as, as, as intellectuals. Let's, 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 let's engage with the preamble of the act. The, the, this legislation aims to promote good management of the national estate and to enable, and I want you to underline enable, is our legislation enabling us to transform the spatial, uh, the spatial um, um, landscape. And it encourages community to nurture and conserve their legacies. Which, which, which of these communities have been encouraged Courage have been somehow actually educated to conserve. Which of these communities are we talking about? It goes on to say, this legacies will be bequeathed to the, to the next generation. So what, what are we bequeathing? Whose, whose histories, whose narratives are we bequeathing to the next, to the next generation? And, and why is it that our, our heritage landscape, it is skewed to a particular kind of disposition or, or governance for that, or regime for that matter, and it's not acknowledging the current, the shift. So, so the the governance, the political governance is shifting. The interest of the governance is shifting, but the heritage landscape is exactly what it is. So, access, but understand that you're going to have to actually live what what we have. We we're not allowing you to do. It goes on to say, lie to us. It goes on to say. It helps us to define our cultural identity and therefore lies at the heart of our spiritual well-being and has the power to build our nation. Build our nation, for me, the binary is quite clear. In South Africa, there's a black heritage and there's a white heritage. And the black heritage and the white heritage are occupying two ends of the binaries and nobody wants to converge so that they can have a conversation. It, it was quite clear when we were looking at the review of the uh, of, of, of the empty and stained statue. The one person was speaking from this particular side, the other person was speaking to that other side. What do you sit with at the end of the day? Irrational discourse, right? Because everybody's advocating for, but I'm here and I don't belong. So why do I need to be confronted with symbols that speaks to a particular kind of uh, a, a time in a historical timeline that I cannot resonate with? The question again is, is this particular uh, statue really embodying the current values of the university, but of, of that of South Africa? Difficult question to ask but our legislation is actually not not answering that so it is it is that that we also need to ask whether our legislation it's really enabling like it claims is it really building our nation like it claims is it is it affirming like it claims and if it is not what is it that we need to do in the in, in the interest of making sure that we actually review now right at the end i want to ask this particular question ultimately if we understand that there's a dire need for spatial transformation the question that we probably have to ask is whose conception then of the past should still prevail in the in the public realm, whose conception of the present should prevail in the current realm, but also for the future. And how do we balance the old and the new so that we do not dump history? Those are probably some of the current debates that we want to, to start um, engaging with as we go forward. I'll listen to your comment and then I'll, I'll, I'll respond accordingly. Thank you so much. I'm so glad your mic is working. <laughs> <laughs> wow, um, I think that was wonderful. I want to sort of, um, that's all of what you were saying and ask questions based on what you were saying, especially um, about um, public spaces, right? And if you think about human evolution, there are, there's the cradle, which is an important heritage site, and there are many public spaces that are a result of this colonial um, paleoanthropological history and are, they, they, they validize certain individuals <laughs> um and they exclude certain individuals from the narrative and so to Puyo, i wanted to ask what how do you think we can change that um create spaces 
um, as, as paleoanthropologists um, and through our research and through the spaces that we work in that can be inclusive um, and, and work towards what um, the, the Heritage Act wants to achieve. Um, thanks, thanks, Rachi. Actually, Mozartebe, thank you very much for, for such thought-provoking questions. I mean, um, you know, the minute you started saying the legislation, for me, uh, I thought we are talking about legislation. So basically now we are acknowledging how the basis for heritage is politics. We are acknowledging the foundation of what heritage is, is the political landscape. I mean, um, so when, when Mozartebe is talking about um, negotiating spaces, um, I, uh, uh, ownership of spaces. We are talking. We are basically. We are essentially acknowledging that, with the basis of everything heritage related, is based on who is the current administration, who is the current government, and how they are governing. I mean, if you're talking about space, take the creative for example, Robin. We are talking about uh, negotiating spaces, creating identities through these spaces that are being presented to the public. Let's take the Cradle of Humankind, for example. I mean, if you're talking about uh, heritage and creating a South African identity, a, a world heritage identity, when you're talking about a site like a Cradle of Humankind, how do we talk about space as South Africans when we have a fence that has been built around a Cradle of Humankind? When myself as a South African, I can't just walk into the space. How do I create an identity? How do I acknowledge that as my heritage? It's supposed to be my, it's my heritage as a South African. It's my heritage as a, as a world citizen. It's, it's a world heritage, it's my heritage. But then we are now, I now have to negotiate this space that has been created by, through political interfaces that have created this fences that I cannot access. And, and, and there is also, I mean, some of the practices as to how we, we, we bring in people into this heritage. Uh, you know, the, the, I always, every time I think about this space, I feel like, oh, you know, the, the concept, right, of admission reserved. It, 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 it rings true for me because when it comes to these heritage spaces that are supposed to be inherent part of our identity, but however, they're not accessible. How do I not access what is supposed to be an inherent part of my identity? You know, that's why I love when Mr. Tebe is reflecting on this legislation that is supposed to enable, that is supposed to empower, that is supposed to, you know, to offer us, however, it is exclusive, it is exclusionary, and that's where the basis of all these inequalities come from. They come from these very, uh, this very uh, legislation that, 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 that purports to enable, to empower, to provide the resources, however, they do the quite the opposite. I mean, if you look at, you know, let's look at the National Heritage Act, the National Heritage Act and, and how it describes heritage, how it's how heritage is inscribed, that's, that's a process that is highly exclusionary. It excludes the bulk of the population, if not the majority of the population. How I mean, how heritage is recognized, how it's inscripted, how it's um, nominated at different uh, levels, how how it becomes uh, uh, recognized as heritage, and how it's uh, opened up or closed up the basis of which lies on the politics of the day. And, and I think that it's quite important for us to understand that um, the fluidity of the concept that is heritage and also acknowledging that in as much as Mutate was even talking about um, this white heritage, this black heritage, this colored heritage, this Indian heritage, all these different heritages, their acknowledgement, their presence in our current context is highly, it's a, it's a political, uh, they are based on a political foundation. And that is very important. What is acceptable today is heritage. Some of, I mean, I, I think about some heritage sites that come to mind that what is acceptable today in South Africa is heritage. Come a new government, come a new dispensation. Those might not even be recognized. Those might even be allowed to wither away. And, and it's quite important for all for us to constantly acknowledge the political, the geographical, the social economic context of these heritages. I don't know if I, if I answered your question, but for me, Mutatebe, you you brought up a lot of um, a, a lot of nuance to what is heritage and how we should even think about heritage. Thank you so much, and I, um, yeah, I just want to say I think you answered like how do we in South Africa 
create because a lot of it is about conservation and um, making sure that we don't <laughs> lose the fossils and they are important but also how do we the value of the site is people connecting with that space so how do we create that and how do we use the epistemologies of the south, south the, the knowledge in the south that it is our relationship to the land is important and having access to the land and not having it pheasants off might be something to consider when it's a heritage site in africa um and 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 i think Jonathan, i also wanted to ask you how i think so you talk about um ethiopia not having a colonial history and i think um that that lends itself to this idea of the the knowledge and ethiopians being very pri proud of their heritage and knowing a lot about their heritage and how that um impacts um heritage practice in ethiopia um this 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 rich history, this awareness, um, and and this idea of of really embracing the knowledge that is there. As not, like if I think about Ethiopian New Year, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like you can have your New Year, but we have our own New Year. <laughs> so, and 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 just having that as a, a a basis from which you start these conversations. How do you think it shapes the the heritage conversation um, in Ethiopia? Um, yeah. Thanks, Robin. I, I totally agree that Ethiopia has a very deep and rich history, and it's one of the oldest um, nations in, in the continent, and one of the oldest Christian as well as uh, Muslim nations as well. Um, and the people are very religious and traditional, uh, but at the same time, they have a very deep connection to, to, the, to their heritage. In fact, even to the deep heritage, including human evolution, so much so, so that it, you know, most of the, the new knowledge that, that we have in the field has made it its way um, a, into the curriculum. Um, and so we are educating um, the young with this new knowledge. And um, the po in terms of policies as well, we have uh, uh, very good policies. We have uh, a relatively independent research leaders that are Ethiopians that, uh, uh, that uh, figure prominently uh, um, internationally uh, but that said um, I, I should also um, stress that you know colonialism is over uh, or maybe over on the continent of Africa but coloniality is is uh, still rampant and we still see the um, the the influences of it in you know in deciding uh, you know who's past and and um, as constructed by whom and as exhibited and celebrated as as what so these concepts um, have, I think, opened up for um, Western stakeholders with, with, um, different, um, um, with different notions to come and um, contribute to the convulsion, if you will, of the identity and heritage of um, Ethiopians as well as uh, humanity. I mean, most of the, the heritage in the National Museum uh, for Human Evolution is um, of universal value, I should I should say. But if you look at that, for example, it is uh, late, it has lately been organized uh, by uh, the French again, when there are over a dozen internationally renowned Ethiopian uh, professionals in the field. I mean, none of us were consulted, and there are a lot of uh, problems with the way the, the exhibition is organized. You don't see Ethiopianness in that. You don't see Ethiopia as uh, you know as the the focal point in that. In fact, you see Chad more than you see in, more than you see Ethiopia in the current human evolution exhibition in the National Museum, which is uh, you know which which makes me really really mad. Um, and so you know beyond ownership uh, policy um, and other things, uh, I think as Becky has just uh, mentioned in in the comment section, it's power politics that we see. There are certain groups that are very powerful that are, let's say, bribing local policy makers and, uh, and uh, technocrats. Um, there is problem with uh, capacity building and often the problem that will be mentioned is that there is not enough professionals, there, not, there is not enough qualified people. But I mean, how on earth do you expect to have enough educated local um, Africans, when you make sure that this system is perpetuated, when you make you're making sure that 
you know, Africans remain um, subordinate to Western researchers, you know. So th the problem I think for me is about education, about capacity building, um, about executing the policies that we have on paper uh, as effectively. So m many people can, can, um, can look up to Ethiopia and say that, okay, you guys are doing uh, relatively well. Uh, my colleague Rahab has also mentioned that in the comment section. Um, I agree to some extent, but I still say that this is not enough. We need to move even beyond and further in this, in this time and age. And um, I should also mention that, you know, there is a very strong inertia um, um, in this field, but there's also an increasing number of uh, scholars that advocate for change in this field. Um, so we should, you know, we should join hands and we should even ask for more and, um, and work uh, for the realization of, you know, a heritage that Africans can celebrate as Africans, can define as Africans and can uh, enjoy and, um, and live as Africans. Thanks, Jonathan. And I think yeah, you spoke to um, enabling like the ways in which it is enabled with all its issues in Ethiopia, but also enabling um, and what um, what Satebi was talking about, what our heritage le legislation wants to achieve, but what it doesn't achieve. And so my question is, and I'll, I'll start with Mutsatebe, and maybe everyone can answer, how do you think, Mutsatebe, we start listening to the knowledge from the South? Um, and how do we become <laughs> epistemically disobedient? And I think, yeah, what do you think um, we need to do to create the space for that to happen? Um, so, I mean, um, I think um, it, it's very critical that we, we we reassert, we reclaim the our definition and meaning of of what we consider as heritage. At what point did a human skull become an object? At, at, at what point do we pick up human skull when we're doing archaeological diggings? And we take this human skull, including the down child, Dipu, including the down child. That, that has been robbed its, its humanity. And it's now a display for museum consumption. At what point did we lose the essence that um, we, we understand humanity as spiritual, humanity as, as a cultural knowledge, and, and that we have a narrative of what happens when the person passes? So at, at what point is my skull good enough to be labeled as a, as a heritage object? just because my skull existed in a particular space and it was at this space that was deemed significant because there's one, there was a meteorite. At, at, at what point do we, do we, do we, do we give up to, to this heritage notion as, as Eurocentric, as, as ethnocentric at its best, as colonial, to, to tell us how to define our own, our own heritage and, and how to actually practice our, our own heritage. That's, that's, that's for me very fundamental. But I always take solace from, and this is just to really engage people to understand that everybody else's voice matter. Steve Biko at one stage, I cannot remember where I read that. He says, if a perception of, the, of something um, about a particular community is divided, it entrenches the binary. So we, we all speak to heritage, but we're not wanting to acknowledge the fact that every person has a specific discernment as far as the construct of heritage first is concerned. And there's nothing wrong with that. It is everything wrong. I'm, I'm getting to whose power. It is everything wrong to think that somebody's memory is better to be memorialized when other people's memories are not better to be memorialized. The museum, and, and now you're forcing me to go back to what Mandela said in 1990, in 1997, when he was opening the the, um, the Robben Island Museum, right? In 1997, he says, during colonial and apartheid times, our museum and monuments reflected the experiences and political ideals of minorities to the exclusion of others. So uh, is it not where we need to start to go and, and dismantle the definition of what a museum is? Is the museum a codification of, of some 
narrative, a text that actually reduces, particularly a black person, to 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 all the the, the bad things that you can start to imagine. Is is it not where we need to start to say? How, how do we reimagine? How do we reposition? Museum? We cannot the whole time just camouflage the museum with the so-called for educational ends. Whose educational ends? Have you seen a museum that also have, I mean, if, if, if people go to the museum and you told this is Australopithecus, this is, this is uh, uh, Homo habilis, what do they look like? Do they look white? Is it is it only black people that that form part of the Australopithecus and 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 Austro, uh, whoever and 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 robust and Homo habilis? Is it were, were they only, is it the only way that we at what point are we going to say actually our memories here are misrepresented that we need to to really just bring down every single text that exists in the museum and start rewriting that so that it speaks to to our own to, to our own context we we have a struggle over memory and effectively we're going to have a struggle as far as the the the, the memorialization principle is concerned there's a constant con conversation here between oppression and repression there's a constant conversation between oppression and marginalization and this 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 is a consistent kind of emergence of a double intent that assess the true vision of the history based on the memories and that of people that are demanding that their memories should be represented but with an element of justice. So it is, it is at what point are we going to take it upon ourselves to rewrite this history because this history was written by some uh, uh, archaeologists from the north and we are quick to also teach this, this archaeological text with, with a, a subtle element of, yeah, we, 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 we should take this with a pinch of a salt. No, let's, let's be disobedient. If this memory needs to be chucked out, we need to chuck it out so that we can at least go reclaim a text and our own narrative as, as it emerges from, from, from the global south. And in that way, I'm not saying we should get rid, in that way, the south can speak to the north. And, and if we if we want to really have the South to speak to the North, then we can we can at least allow people to also uh, form part of that functional praxis where everybody's voice is going to be heard. Not because this voice knowledge is, is that that needs to see colonization, that needs to be westernized, that needs to see the the, the light because it's still dark. That's my that's my view. Thank you so much, Mosetsebe. And again, you're getting me thinking a lot, but I, I just want to make two points and then I'll hand over to the other panelists. And, and I want to say, the first thing I want to say is, yeah, we have to take seriously the impact of the collection of people um, and particular groups of people and, and how that is still part of the system of dehumanization that exists outside of the museum and informs that. And our arguments to hold on to particular groups of people are a part and parcel of the, the bigger world that we live in um, that is still racist and is still divisive and oppressive. And we have to see the connection between the two. Otherwise, it's easy to disconnect and say, well, I'm just doing my research on these human domains. I'm not racist, <laughs> but, but, but it informs the, the, the world that we live in and who is valued as, as, a, as a human and who isn't valued as a human. And I think also what is important is to, um, what comes up for me is the power of fossils, which we were talking about also, like in my mind, even when you say, how do we do you imagine also look at the scenes? I'm like, that's not the problem. <laughs> it's so deeply entrenched. Um, and, and I think fossils are also powerful because I think of, I think of Lewis Leakey, who was a bad archaeologist at some point in his life, <laughs> didn't, didn't know where, and then he lost, he didn't get funding, and then he had to work for the British government as a spy, he was, he was informing on the Kikuyu, and when, when, when there was independence, he was still allowed to practice, do you know what I mean, Jomo Kenyatta, <laughs> he still had his museum, and, and, and it's because fossils are um, a powerful, um, powerful commodities in the world, right? The North want to have access to fossils, um, and 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 so you have governments having to renegotiate. How do we deal with these uh, these paleoanthropologists and the science that was so racist? But actually, it, it provides a lot of tourism, um, a lot of research. It, it makes us a prestigious nation. So how, so how do we grapple with that as 
biological anthropologist and that's just something that came up for me while I was listening to you. But I want to hand over to Jonathan or to Puyo, do you want to share about how you think we can sort of reach the goals that, um, of, the, of the Heritage Act? Thanks, Robin. I actually want to first, before I make my point, I want to respond to Mozart Harry about astropathicines and homo habilis looking like Africans. Actually, they are they were Africans based in this continent. So the likelihood is their skin tone was my, like mine and yours, Mozart Harry. So that, that's the first thing. I don't want people to get away from here and say, oh, archaeologists are saying we need to think about how they, they look like, they probably look like with the skin tone of mine and yours, Mozart Harry, because they were Africans both now. When you're talking about Neanderthals and, uh, and other, uh, other uh, hominins, possibly with a different skin tone, but your astral pathogens and homo habilis, my, uh, they were dark skinned like myself and you, Mozart Harry. Um, I, I want to talk to the issue of museums and how, how we frame museums and how we, we, we present this heritage in museum and how we get this ownership of the heritage that exists within the, the museums by our locals, by our people. But one thing that we're also forgetting is that the concept of a museum, um, uh, Jonathan, the concept of a museum coming from a, 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 a country that has not been colonized, the concept of a museum, is, is, is that an African concept to have a museum, to have a space that is locked up where artifacts, and by artifacts, I'm being, I'm, I'm being, I'm even including what we consider our human remains are being locked up in boxes in the name of curation, in the name of preservation, in the name of conservation. The concept of a museum where we go and we gawk at what is the other, you know, the, the point of a museum and, and a museum ex ex exhibition, especially if you're exhibiting uh, human artifacts, human uh, remains, it, it's the concept of, I mean, I, I can't go and look at myself at an exhibition, can I? Because I'm not the other. So I go and I otherize those exhibitions so it's, it's basically it's, it's, it's the same concept as it, it's, it's highly colonial in its in its outlook in its in its uh, in its essence you know you you come into a space and you walk and you are amazed or you or you you you, you feel a different a, a certain sentiment about those other people that is the whole point of a of a museum the, the museum it's it's rare that you find I, I i could not take my artifacts and go put them in the museum and go look at my artifacts that i identify with that are part of me you know the, the point of a museum and, and i think it's where museum practitioners ourselves as uh, practitioners in the field we need to start rethinking this concept i mean you have a museum like the digital museum of natural history that is now called digital Museum of Natural History, which was the Transvaal Museum that was constructed what, in 1892 or something. It still looks the same in 2021. It's, it's still the same building. It's still the same. Um, it's still the same. I'm sure some of those boxes, considering that it hasn't been revamped in eons, it's still, I mean, that concept in itself should be problematic to ourselves. As Africans, we should we should really be. I mean, that's a national museum that is supposed to be one of, one of our uh, uh, towering museums that we present to the world. I mean, that should be problematic in itself. Your Ezekiel's, your your your, your essay museum in Bloemfontein. We should have a problem ourselves as Africans presenting those kinds of buildings, those kinds of uh, 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 statues that are associated artifacts. We should have a problem as Africans say, to 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 embody those as our museums that we are presenting to the world. I mean, and also othering ourselves, because basically that's what we are doing as well. I mean, if you are having your 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 cultural artifacts, your Twana artifacts in the Bloemfontein Museum or your Sutu artifacts, you are othering yourself in itself. It's colonial mindset. And we need to start ourselves. And, and you know, it becomes sad because, and, and I'm also part of the problem. I'm not going to, to make it somebody else's problem. It becomes problematic as ourselves being trained within these colonial disciplines that we perpetuate the very same colonial practices in the name of I'm um, educated, uh, uh, you know, I have a master's and I have PhD in archaeology, so I know what I'm doing. Basically, in essence, you are just perpetuating what is the problem. And then we have a we and we we, we don't even understand why our locals don't identify with museums. Why our locals, I mean, it, it, it's in itself, a museum is just a foreign concept in itself. I mean, you, you have a new age 
um, uh, South Africans that are now, you know, going to museums to galleries, but those concepts are of the other. They, they, they are different from who we are in the essence of who we are. And I think us uh, practitioners in the field, local practitioners in the field, we are also part of the problem because in as much as we understand our, our disciplines based on our training, we also, the decolonial project should start with us. And, and, and ourselves, the four of us right now on the screen that I see, we are also part of the problem, Mozart, Tebe, Yonatan, and Robin. We are also part of the problem because we perpetuate what we have been taught by our colonial uh, lecturers that were taught us at Jovetsis. And we, we are constantly on each and every day practice. You know, there are days when I look at my work and I'm thinking, how am I still teaching some of the things that I learned? in as much as we are trying to present them in a new way, in a blended learning, UJ, you know, the, the password is blended learning, but I'm still perpetuating the same concepts. Here and there, you try to include recent data, you know, up-to-date information, but the essence of what is it that we teach, how we train, how we practice, it is essentially colonial in, in nature. And, and I think we need to be, we need to, the conversation now needs to start being museum practitioners, lecturers, heritage practitioners, how are you different? This decolonized, uh, this decolonized movement, what is it all about? Because is it just about using different terminology? Because I, I, I feel like most of the time when we're talking about the decolonization project, for us it's about the terminology, it's about how we report, we are reporting on different types of terminologies, we are now using our African names. What is this decolonization project that we are embarking on? It seems like even ourselves, as people who should be champions of this decolonizing process, we are we really, I feel like we are failing, and myself included on that. We are failing with this decolonization process. I mean, 20 years post-1994 in South Africa, we should not currently still be having these kinds of discussions that you know we need to decolonize, we, we, need, we need to think about what is it, how we are presenting, we need to think about museums. You know, every time I look at that Tizong Museum, it makes me sad to think you know, my, my great great grandfather probably knew about this museum and it still looks the same and it's still being presented. Even the current up to date uh, uh, exhibitions, they reflect exactly the colonial practices that have always been in place at the museum. Actually, I could go on and on, so I think I should give my, <laughs> my colleague. <laughs> No, it was. I uh, thank you so much, Puyo. I think, like you were saying, what we all <laughs> went, wanted to say, so and it was necessary. Um, and and I think, um, Jonathan, I think I, we have the question and answer session coming up soon. So, if people have any questions, could you please um, put them in the question or in the chat? Um, and Jonathan, how do you think we can um, change museums or? What do you think are some of the steps? And, and just a question to Jonathan, yeah. coming from Ethiopia, how, from a non yeah. a country that has not been colonized, how do you, how have your museum and your presentation of the heritage being framed in isolation to the colonial, um, your, 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 your history as a country that has not been colonized? Um, and, I, and I also want to ask Jonathan, based on your um, heritage work with communities, how have you, taken seriously community to African ideas and African concerns about sites and archaeological work? Um, so to the first question by Dupio, um, I would say that the museum is not much different, any much different um, from the Kenya National Museums or other museums here in South Africa, because um, simply because it was organized mostly by Westerners. Um, the country had opened its doors and begged for these colonial mentalities to be reflected in its own heritage when it could have taken the advantage of it not being colonized, not having been colonized and organize its own exhibition. So for, for that simple fact, I, I'm, not, I'm not happy with the way the, the museum exhibition is, is organized. Um, the, the, narr the narration, um, the voices that are, that are reflected in the, in the exhibition, I'm not happy with that. And if you even take the, the historical aspect, there is a big uh, debate in Ethiopia um, um, that the historical archaeology, which was again organized by um, German archaeologists, historical archaeologists from over a hundred years ago, 
reflects mostly the northern parts of the country, the, the history of the northern parts of the country, and uh, you know the kings and the emperors and and whatnot. Whereas the southern nations, the uh, uh, the southern ethnic groups and and parts of the the country have been highly marginalized and have been asking this question that whatever is being exhibited at a national scale in a national museum does not represent them and they cannot relate to whatever is being exhibited and you know ethiopianness is not reflected there you know only a part is reflected but then to that the response of the most most uh, technocrats working in the museum and and serving the government has been that you know how much of it can we exhibit in this small space in such small space and um, with such limited capacity so there's there's an ongoing debate um, I think um, my suggestion will be to uh, listen to the communities to to have uh, you know several dialogues and and open uh, platforms and to to listen to the voices of the people so that we will have a better chance of reflecting enough of their voices in the way that the museum should be conceived of, the exhibitions should be um, organized and and um, uh, and displayed, and in the takeaways that we want, um, first Ethiopians, um, you know, as local local uh, uh, consumers, to take away from from uh, the, the museums. And then, of course, the rest of um, uh, I would say the rest of Africa first, and then and then the rest of the world. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, and I think it even speaks to how um, we were saying we all are part of this problem, and we all take particular actions, and how even when we try and um, make it a, a, a particular Ethiopian exhibit, we can still have the hierarchies and particular histories um, valorized and colonialism that even when we talk about ourselves we talk about ourselves um, sorry <laughs> sorry i think i froze for a moment yes. process. <laughs> so there are um a few questions um and i'll ask um so Tupuyo, someone was asking as a heritage manager, how, and, and I think with that table, you can also at least uh, respond to this. How do, what about the notion of being um, people centered um, approaches to resources in terms of conservation? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm rewording it, but immediate as a heritage manager, what do you say about the notion of gazetting such people-centered resources, spirituality in the name of con conservation? Um, because in the name of conservation, you find that people at some point are denied access to resources and then they vandalize it. So, so how do we um, create policies that enable and acknowledge that people might, this might be an important heritage and we need to go the heritage site and we need to convert, conserve it. But also people have been engaging with the site long before you declared it a heritage site. And if they want access to it and, and if you don't give them access, they might respond by vandalizing the site um, because then they're not able to, um, they're not engaged with meaningfully. And what do you think, how do you think, and do you think we can do about that? It's, uh, I mean, I, I want to also just link up with what Dipur was saying earlier on about the museum. And I want to ask, um, is erecting statues the best way to tell the African story? It's, I mean, just leave the museum. Museum is a built structure. We, we make collection and we, we keep them there and people can go visit that. I'm talking about at least trying to... Um, I want to say it, a special reimagination re for towards inclusivity and that the poor statue needs to stand in the center of Hoffman Square, for example. Now, Dipu, when I'm upset one day with your rich narrative, with the kind of contribution that you would have made, when I'm upset one day because of service delivery, what do I do to your statue? I pee on it. it is, is this our African way of 
documenting and retelling stories by erecting statues. Is, is, is this our way of, of telling us, first documenting somebody else's story? I mean, everybody's on about, uh, let's erect a statue in memory of, let's, let's erect a statue in memory of. Is this our African way? And I don't know. I mean, I'm young. Can you see me? I'm only 21. So I don't know. I really don't know whether there was, there was, a, there was this kind of erection of statues to tell our own stories or, or or are we subscribing now to the notion that is actually foreign to us? And like the poor say, that we effectively complicit to the reproduction of the same problems that we, we're trying to actually referee against. That's one. To be able to reassert an African way of doing these things, we need to go back to what, what is the essence behind what we're doing. And for me, it should be, we should be actually looking at it from a functionalism perspective. So, what function can it serve? And so if, if it is an object, then I can tell you now that it's going to be reduced to object centrism kind of discourse. But if, if we tackle it from a functionalism kind of perspective, then we're going to ask important question. If we erect a memorial, what function will it serve? And so we need to be asking the function what and then of course we can start asking the value that it adds right so, so that at least when i tell you the story I, I i i don't just tell a story you walk away with something that speaks to the value something that speaks to the uh, to the function but we we have to also start thinking about sustainable development right? so, so that it's not something that will will keep on shifting because uh, the next generation does not actually re resonate with the statue of Mandela somewhere in center, somewhere in Bloemfontein on top of Neville Hill, when actually the rest of the population in, in, in Bloemfontein are that of the Basutu. And it, it, it will get, and, and please don't quote me, quote me on this, it will get to a point where it's going to be, but this is, this is a Basutu territory, ethnicism, ethnicism. This is a Basutu territory. What is, what, what is the Kosa man doing on top of the mount? Do, do you see now he's no more just a political leader who is renowned in the world and in, in he, he gets to because we, we are working with and, and this is something about transformation. It never ends. It's continuing. So that's why I, I, I would like us to ask those fundamental questions, the value, the function, so that at least there's sustainable development. And unless we're able to answer those particular questions, stop erecting statues. Statues do not tell the African story. As soon as we're tired with the statue, we pee on them. You've seen most how we painted statues because they ran out of political prominence. They ran out of whatever prominence. And we will paint it, we will throw toilets on them, and so we could continue ask fundamental question, and then there's a greater chance that we could actually have a sort of an alternative or an emerging alternative way of our documentation and retaining our stories. Um, thank you, Motsatebe. And I think with, with regards, uh, maybe to you want to talk about the statues. Um, and then also, I think when, when um, the, the question, um, is also related to um, how do we, I think it's, it's, you know, cave sites that have rock art in that people also use um, as spiritual sites. And, and so people want to conserve the rock art and then they don't let people have access to the site and then people end up vandalizing the site. And I think that's what they're asking about. But do you just want to go ahead to Puyo? Um, Robin, I don't know why you're asking me to talk about statues because I start getting political. Um, that? <laughs> you know, actually, I don't get them. So honestly, in this day and age, I don't get the function. I don't get the the use, and I have my opinions as to why we continue. I think recently, last week or so, I saw that there was a new statue that is coming up somewhere around Houting. There's a new, and it it, it, um, it blows my mind that we are still building statues in 2021. You know, and because I believe when we want to present our heritage, when we want to uh, re renew, rejuvenate the the because I think the whole point of the the justification that we get about these statues that are currently being built in 2021 during a pandemic is that you know we are celebrating the lives, we are celebrating 
um, our, our, our former leaders that have brought us uh, into this new era of democracy. However, I believe if we want to rejuvenate, if you want to um, correct what has been, uh, the past, what we need to do is to do change that is fundamental, change that, that you know, that brings about transformation from the grassroots. A statue, I, can I talk about something else? <laughs> can I talk about something else, Robin? Because it, it, it really gets me worked up that currently in 2021, South Africa during a pandemic, we're still building statues. Nonsense. Yeah. Nonsense. yeah. So, so I, I want to talk about how we bring about communities and make sure that, you know, uh, we don't expose what we call the heritage to vandalism, graffiti, and all of that. If there is no ownership of the heritage, trust and believe that the end point is going to be vandalism. The end point is going to be non-identification of those resources. The communities that have in the past been custodians of this heritage. And if you look at some of the before and after photos of a lot of this heritage that we have currently, look at your various rocket sites around the country, look at, um, look at, um, your mapungubus of this world, those have been conserved and preserved by communities for centuries. Then comes colonial South Africa, then comes apartheid South Africa, and now currently we are sitting with the problem of vandalism of our so-called heritage sites, so-called heritage resources. What has happened pre-colonial times during colonial times, during apartheid, and now that has led to communities not identifying with what we call heritage. Communities do not identify currently. However, you find that these the very same communities used to preserve and conserve those heritage sites. I mean, a lot of these rocket uh, sites, the graffiti that you have, even if you look at the graffiti, some of them will even inscribe the date on them. They are of a colonial period. They are during the apartheid period. They are current. However, these were sites that were protected prior to this, uh, to, to, to that history. And I think the problem right now that we keep on perpetuating is we are not being inclusive. We are not providing ownership to the communities of this heritage. They don't, they don't identify with all this heritage now. They used to identify with it. They don't identify with this heritage. And, and I think the issues are broader than just heritage, they are broader than just what has uh, the practices within the heritage space, within archaeology, paleoanthropology, uh, within the, 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 the issues with why communities are currently not identifying with those heritage resources is are broader than that. However, we need, to, uh, we need to remember that these heritage resources at some point were preserved, they were conserved. They continued for centuries. And then comes the past century of South Africa where now we're seeing vandalism of this so ownership her, going back to the definition of what heritage is supposed to be it's about to be it's it's it's, it's, it's your identity your identity your heritage is supposed to be related to what to identify with if i don't identify it's not heritage to me so those communities do not feel like those heritage resources that have been imposed now imposed in a different way in a different way to them there's no ownership there is no identification with what government now is trying to do with those heritage resources and i think it's very important that we, in our in our so-called inclusivity superficial inclusivity of communities which is what we are doing currently when we're talking about including communities when you're talking about being equal, equal access we are being superficial it's all of a sudden what we're trying to do and communities know that they are aware that these the, 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 uh, whatever it is that we are doing, whatever developments that we are doing, we're not necessarily doing it for them. They are aware of that. When we're talking about oh, we, uh, trans, uh, economic tourism, we're talking about uh, uh, creating jobs. They know that it's superficial. They are aware of that. And that is where the problem starts. Thanks, Tupuya. And I think that was a very good um, place to end. It's uh, uh, Unfortunately, I would love to talk some more, but we have to. <laughs> close um, and Wendy will close soon and but I think it is such an important place to end to to remember that communities have connected with this heritage and we need to reckon with the ways in which we connect disconnected them and marginalize them um from that heritage and why how do we give them the ownership and um but now I'll hand over to Wendy thanks everyone 
Thank you, Robin. I'm sure we could all talk about all of this for hours, and there are really so many things to discuss within so many layers. Um, there are many more discussions to have. Uh, thank you very much to our panelists and to Robin for moderating this conversation. And thank you to all of you for participating and being here. Dipoy, you have a question or a comment? Yeah. Wendy, I'll, can I, before you close, yeah. please give me an opportunity to plug my our presentation that we're having next week sure. <laughs> at, <laughs> at the Your Research Institute. Please give me an opportunity to do that. Um, sure. Um, so there are many more discussions we need to have and we'd like to keep this conversation going and let's all work together and challenge others to promote this decolonial practice in our spheres of influence. And so thank you everyone. And now to Depoyo for plugging her seminar and then we hope to see you all here again soon. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. I don't, know, I don't know if I can share or I'm not allowed to share. But anyway, um, colleagues, um, on, Mon on Monday, the 28th of September, we are having a discussion about women in paleo sciences, their experiences and beyond 2021. Please join us. Go to our social media pages uh, and register to come and join the event. It's happening at 3 o'clock South African time on the 28th of September. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone.